a photograph of God? Or is it, does it matter? Who cares, especially as many of you are from the Protestant tradition? Who cares? So what about the Shroud of Turin? We're going to get into it. And I brought my friend along, PJ, who's a historian. Thank you for being with us for this one, PJ. Hello, it's good to be here. The Shroud of Turin, what should Protestants make of it all? I'm going to give some info and then part two will be PJ answering the question, so what? Rapid fire and PJ correct me along the way. The Shroud of Turin is in Turin in Italy in the Church of St. John the Baptist. It's like a sort of a relic thing, but the Roman Catholics call it an icon, not a relic. It's like a big cloth. It's about 14 feet long, three and a half feet wide. It has on it the image of a crucified man pressed into it. The head, the face, the arms, the body, they're all there. It's even got blood on it. So the Turin Shroud is a length of linen bearing the image of a man who appears to have suffered physical trauma in a manner consistent with crucifixion. It's got the front of the man on it. It's got the back of the man on it. The Gospels mention linen cloths. It actually says strips. So we'll talk to PJ about that in a bit. Which wrapped up the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people are saying this is that cloth. Here's some history. After the resurrection, the records, the written records of it go a bit quiet. The next written records of it basically reappear in France in about 1389. It's kept in Chambéry, Chambéry Cathedral. Then in 1578, it's brought from there to Turin. We're going to get into its authenticity in a second, but PJ, have I said anything wrong yet? I suppose it's worth emphasizing the that that Frenchman is a crusader knight who went to Constantinople and that's where he said he got the shroud and uh, in Constantinople we have sermons dedicated to the shroud of Jesus so the people in Constantinople believed they had it this guy believed he got it from got the true shroud of Jesus from Constantinople so there are uh, bits of history there so it kind of um, we don't see it move around so much we see it like taken basically from Jerusalem or Odessa to Constantinople. And then kind of the record's quiet, but that seems like just because it was kept there. Because we do have sermons every now and then where someone brings out the shroud and shows it to everyone. Um, so we do have a literary history of the artifact in a way. And it is worth mentioning that, that there is, um, as we get into the physical evidence on the shroud itself, that there is documentation, which is always helpful to have as well. Thank you. We come to the questions of its authenticity. There were tests done on the Turin Shroud in the 1970s, where they were looking more at the photographic image nature of the man in the shroud. Get into that in a bit. Then in the 80s, 1988, scientists were given permission to analyze a piece of the shroud and subjected it to radiocarbon-14 dating, and they concluded with 95% certainty that it was not from the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was, in fact, medieval, dating between 1260 and 1319, not the first century, 1390, not the first century, and therefore it was all over. We all went home and went back to our Bible alone. However, as time went on, I think as late as 2019, they realized the sample piece that was tested was from the top corner of the shroud, the end of the shroud. I mean, they already knew that bit, but what they came to know is that's iffy. And it's iffy because the edge of the shroud was added, apparently, by medieval weavers and it was touched by modern hands as they were displaying it to people in the medieval period so for protection the edges things were added to it but that's different from the middle of the shroud 
So the edges had cotton on it, which is nowhere else in the whole shroud. And in the ancient Jewish traditions, they wouldn't have mixed cotton into pure linen. There's no cotton anywhere else on the shroud. The edges also had gum dye mordant, apparently, which is used for textile repairs. So it was likely French weaving had occurred around the edges, probably for protection. Studies conducted in 2012 and 2015 on samples taken earlier found that the linen sheet probably does date from the time of Jesus Christ. We're moving on, rapid fire. Writing in the Open Journal of Trauma, a team speculated that the cause of death of the figure in the shroud was a heart attack complicated by heart rupture through hemopericardium in a subject crucified with the nailing of hands and feet. They also saw signs of emotional stress and depression, severe hypovolemic traumatic shock, acute respiratory failure at an early stage by crucifixion and causalgia, that's chronic pain in a limb, blunt trauma following a fall with paralysis of the entire right brachial plexus, I think that's shoulder nerves, right shoulder dislocation, pulmonary contusion with hemothorax, it's lung injury, cardiac contusion, heart injury, probable left ulnar proximal paralysis and right foot dislocation from stretching during crucifixion. The detail of the shroud is such that you can perform these medical analyses on it. And by the way, whoever it was, they went through a lot and I found that moving, especially if it is our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The study inspired a 2022 paper by the Reverend Professor Patrick Pulicino, who was a priest, but was formerly an NHS consultant neurologist who proposed that the shoulder injury caused a huge internal bleed, which resulted in the collapse of his circulatory system. Also, X-ray diffraction tests were taken of the cloth in 2022, and they found that the material matches other materials from around 2,000 years ago. We move on, everybody, because there's more. New scientific tests conducted on the famous Shroud of Turin have revealed that the flax used to make the linen was grown in the Middle East. But now we come to the image the photo negative quality of the image that you might have seen. So let me get this right. Since modern photography has been invented, we have come to see the hidden image within the Shroud of Turin. What I mean by that is the Shroud, the, the man in the Shroud is a negative print. And if we take that negative print and use a negative photo of the negative print, you get a positive back. And the positive image, the detail of the man, is phenomenal and has revealed even more than we had before the tech to do that. So for them, to have had that amount of detail back then without the tech that we've got to see what they've done is impossible. Like the tech didn't exist regarding the photo negative quality of this image or the positive quality of this image that we get now by extracting it. They would have needed a UV light so powerful to do the image as they've done like this, well, it didn't exist at the time. This image of a man is from another light source, which didn't exist at the time, and that we're only now catching up to. 
an explosion of UV light would have had to go through the cloth to produce this type of photonegative image. And there was no tech at the time that did that. There's also no brush strokes, no paint, no dye, no bleach, no pigments, no binders, no carriers. This image and the blood in the image or on the image are exclusively unique. Moving on, the image seems to have Pontius Pilate coins over the eyes of the man. It has wounds in the right place that correspond with the narratives in the Bible. Everything John says in the Bible is in this image. People go to jail on this kind of compelling evidence. There are whip marks. The person in the image will have been whipped over a hundred times. Someone was inflicting maximum pain and damage on this man. There's evidence of blood from thorns placed on the man's head. Now, not many figures in history that we know of were both crowned and crucified at the same time. There's a wound in his sight. The facial features are consistent with, Jew with a Jewish man in his 30s. There, there are nails through the wrists, not the hands. The blood clotting marks are consistent with a real wound. And the rivulets of blood are consistent with someone lying down and being wrapped in a cloth. There's a whole study on the pollen and the dust. Experts took 58 samples of the pollen found on the shroud and discovered that it was from almost exclusively the Middle East, particularly Turkey and Jerusalem. And some of the flowers don't even exist anymore and did 2000 years ago in Jerusalem. Though some here have said, well, later on when the shroud would have been displayed on an altar, they would have come with flowers then because you wouldn't have had flowers in in an in like a traditional Jerusalem burial. All right, fine. There's still a lot of other evidence here to account for. There's certain types of limestone found on the shroud. Limestone that's discovered in abundance in Jerusalem, particularly from the area of the old Damas Damascus Gate, which is the closest gate to Golgotha. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to be a Christian to realize that we may well have an artifact of a very famous person. You don't have to be a Christian to see that we might have an artifact of the Lord Jesus Christ. PJ, some people say that this is a fraud because John's Gospel says they use strips of linen, not one big cloth and that the face cloth was different from the body cloth, according to John's gospel. So why is the face on the main cloth here? Is it all over, PJ? Is it a fraud? Are we done? Is this video done? Well, there's a few things worth noting. So sometimes Greek especially uses plural sometimes to refer to a singular thing but english does it as well so how you have a pair of trousers and it's a single garment and you can't really have a trouser um or and scissors are the same um you just have a blade on its own you don't have a scissor uh, so in the same way sometimes a single artifact a single item is referred to in the plural uh so it can simply be something like that so there's that, but then there's also a lot of history on the holy handkerchief, as they call it. So, yeah, the Bible does mention a handkerchief separately to the burial shroud, but that is accounted for. Um, and particularly the holy handkerchief, they, there's like two main ones. There's the Ver Veronica's veil and the Abgar's holy handkerchief. One important fact about those two things, Veronica's veil and the holy handkerchief of Abgar, is that they have a face which seems consistent with the Shroud of Turin. And what's particularly incredible about that, as you we were talking earlier, is that the whole getting all the details through double negative and then you get a positive and all that has only been available recently. So it would have been quite difficult for a medieval person to have fraudulently created the correct face 
on either of those artifacts. So there's a lot of people that analyze those and say they do show the same face, which seems to suggest they too are miraculous. So we do in fact have a handkerchief that has the face of Jesus on it. These things are accounted for in all our literary references. And as I said, the literary side of it is as important as anything to know this was really handed down from the Middle East and everything. With it, we see the face cloth, the handkerchief mentioned. Um, and of course, we think as well, but then they say, oh, wouldn't you see it in the shroud? Well, you could have just put the handkerchief over the shroud. So you've got a shroud that covers everywhere from his feet to his head. And then they put a handkerchief over that. It's inexplicable, but that was John Calvin's criticism of it. So that had centuries of uh, centuries ago, that had been people's criticism of the Shroud of Turin. So that is one that jumps out at people. So people feel instantly, well, it can't be true. It seems to contradict John's gospel, but there's loads of explanations. Any any one or all of them could be true. And just the linguistic thing, as I said, where plural doesn't really mean separate uh, garments necessarily. You mentioned Calvin. Calvin's big problem was, look, the Gospels say there was a separate cloth for the face, so this is mm -hmm. a fraud. And um, but, it, I mean, if John's Gospels can be, John's Gospel can be proved that the shroud stopped shoulder length and then the top mm -hmm. bit was separate. Fine, it's a fraud, but it is mm -hmm. possible. It seems, mm -hmm. it seems that it's not dogmatic in the Gospels that it. Uh, it could have gone, as you say, head to toe, and then the separate face cloth get placed on top of the face area as well. Uh, yeah, we could even assume a body includes an intact head in usual biblical language. So, before I ask PJ, so what? I don't want us to do the modern Protestant thing too quickly, PJ, wherein we, we basically say, although if we don't say it, we certainly act like it in practice, that nothing physical really matters in this faith of ours. And actually we're to avoid external physical influences in case they stir up in us carnal emotions, whereas we, we need to know for sure what we think and feel is the work of the Holy Spirit. So our churches are beige, there aren't any icons. There's not much art. There's not much out, outside physical expression to help us worship God, body, mind, and soul. Because we just, we're about the work of the Spirit. So we tend to retreat, really, and reduce our faith to Bible study, meditation, and prayer. Those are the safe areas. But... I'm now going to read some relics from the Bible. And the thing is, it's not either or, because the Holy Spirit was at work at the time of these passages. And it's not like now the Holy Spirit has come in such a way that he wasn't working before and anything physical to aid us in worship has now been replaced by the inner work of the Spirit. Here's Exodus 29, 37. Seven days you shall make atonement for the altar and consecrate it, and the altar shall be most holy. Whatever touches the altar shall become holy. That's also repeated in Exodus 30, 25 to 29, where other sacred objects, if touched, then the toucher will also become holy. Then there's 2 Kings 13, 20 to 21. Elisha died and they buried him. Now, bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of that year. And as a man was being buried, lo, a marauding band was seen, and the man was cast into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Here's 2 Kings 2.14. Then he took the mantle of Elijah, that had fallen from him and he struck the water saying where is the lord the god of elijah and when he had struck the water the water was parted to the one side and to the other and elisha went over powerful mantle his acts chapter 5 15 to 16 they, 
They even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and pallets, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. So people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. All right, that might not be a relic, it might be a shadow, but it's still sort of in the same vein here. Acts 19, 11 to 12, and God did extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were carried away from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. There it is, PJ, and there's more as well, handkerchiefs, aprons, and I'm not in the camp that is entirely convinced by the argument that these things were going alongside the preaching of the word at the time of the apostles to authenticate their message as the Bible was being put together and inscripturated. But now that we have the Bible, there is no work of the Spirit like that anymore. I've always found that case really weak. It's poorly put together. And if you're going to draw a line under the work of God, is you've got to have a good case to say that he no longer works miracles like that anymore because all we have now is the Bible. Yeah, and I think you, you think about John's Gospel where he says that Jesus did so many miracles, more than he could write about. So he did so many miracles, many most of which, the vast majority of which, if we take John's uh, description seriously, we're not authenticating a message that would be put into scripture. He just did them. He just healed people. He yeah. just, you know, brought people back from the dead just for the sake of doing it, for being, for showing what Christians should do. Um, and, and I think, yeah, a lot of people of different traditions will find what one tradition believes and then say, oh, we're going to believe the opposite of that. And it was a real case in the Reformation when loads of these denominations were popping up that they were like, our oh, Catholics believe that miracles still happen. So we're going to believe very rationalistic stuff. And I think it's a silly reaction to have to just allow someone's belief uh, to just reverse engineer your own belief. You know what I mean? And um, I think we've got to be really careful and make sure everything we're getting is really just coming start and end from the Bible and I think, yeah, the belief that miracles keep going is much easier to make from the Bible. Um, and yeah, as I said, the Bible never describes like now the apostles are gone, there are no miracles. It never says that. And it would have to say that because it would be monumental where you have miracles happening from creation all the way up to the apostles. And then why would they stop? And people definitely don't believe in the first, second, third, fourth century miracles have stopped. Yeah. You know what I mean? They, they tend to say... It just, the later epistles are, are more quiet about miracles than the early ones, so they are evidently already fizzling out. All right, PJ, so I understand why people um, would not go all in on things like this, because sometimes these things are fraudulent and fake, and then they're tempted to just run back to the Bible, because that is something we know for sure um, isn't, like, wrong. I get it, but the problem is, on the back of that, is this you also end up retreating to your attic and just reducing the faith to meditation and thought. And it's all internal. And there's a massive burden that comes with all that. And God has obviously given us so much more outside of us to help us worship him with body, mind, and soul. So PJ, let's just say, let's just say PJ, that this is a genuine relic. So what? So it means that the God of the Bible is the God of today and that we really can trust how he says the universe works and what he asks us to expect. We can really trust it. So I think a lot of people make a major mistake when they just even hear about the shroud. Their knee-jerk reaction is, oh, it isn't true. I think that's a real problem because we should expect the shroud to be true because we didn't believe Jesus really died and then he really was wrapped in a shroud and then he really did resurrect. 
And so we do believe he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and when his glory showed, it was this incredible light that streamed from him. So if we we're looking for a source of UV light that could create this photographic image, um, why not Jesus himself? We do believe he could do it. Um, so, you know, we think that, and we think, like, the God of the Bible isn't averse to relics. As we said they before, the word remnant, it does occur in the Bible quite a bit. But it also just describes these kinds of relics in detail. One particular standout one for me has always been that when they're going through the Jordan, they pick up some sediment from the bottom of the river and they put it in the Ark of the Covenant so that future generations will be able to see this relic and then remember what the Lord did. And um, this is why we have relics like photographs of special occasions like marriages and so on if we take a vow on some occasion it's good to have a photo there and then you can look at the photo and then you remember what did i say then what did that mean to me how can i keep going in that direction and that is why the lord allowed relics of course there are times we could focus on relics too much and there's one example uh given in the bible of the brazen serpent that moses gave as a testament to people that you're meant to look to this one who's raised on the tree and when you look to him you'll be healed and that that really means all of israel was vowing to look to jesus but then they ended up using the serpent to look not to jesus you know and they used it in the wrong way and at that point it was good to destroy that relic so again, people think like, sometimes people think, oh, there's this big difference in the Bible, you needed relics, now we don't. Well, no, in the Bible, we see just as much like caution around relics. Once it's used as an idol, they get rid of relics. In the Old Testament, they do that. So that's not a New Testament thing. That's not something we do now. But that I think it's also, we look at both sides. So including relics is in the Old Testament and the New Testament, because we saw Peter, his handkerchiefs are able to like raise the dead. If that's how incredible Peter's handkerchiefs were, the holy handkerchief of the Lord God must be even better, we, we would assume. So I think when we're looking at the shroud, we might then look at it and think, I'm personally not convinced, I don't think it... Uh, it tees up with my reading of the gospels i don't think you know i have these problems but you might think that and that's fine if you come to that conclusion by earnestly reading scripture but your gut reaction shouldn't be no it isn't true because we know there is a shroud which covered jesus as he was resurrected but whether or not you're personally convinced i think we should carefully introspect and decide do I believe or disbelieve this for the right reasons? And so there's been a bit of a problem, especially over the last 500 years, where people really divide all of history into like real history and serious history. And this is what leaves evidence and everything because that really happened. And then you have like gospel history, which is well, all this funny, silly stuff and all that. And then it's like, oh, and then you just read that in isolation and think, oh, crazy stuff can happen there. And I think so many of the theological problems we have today are the result of this problem we've had, especially over the last 500 years, of dividing gospel and real history so that we kind of don't, because if we don't expect gospel history to leave evidence and so on, then really, to what extent did it happen in real history or the material world and everything? We kind of are saying it didn't. Whereas we should believe, and I think we do believe, I hope we do believe, that um, Jesus really was in the material world. He came in the flesh, but he also did these miracles in the material world, and that included the resurrection. So it will leave evidence. People have fallen into errors quite recently, but it's the result of this whole path they've taken for 500 years, where they've got moral errors. But it makes sense, really, because if we don't believe that Jesus is telling the truth about quite basic facts, just material facts that you could just check for evidence and see if it happened. How do we know if he's telling the truth about much bigger, more complicated, more serious things like moral issues and spiritual issues? Like, yeah, kind of one goes from the other. And the Lord in the Old Testament always presents it that way. He's like, look. I led you out of Egypt. I did all this stuff in the material world, 
now you can trust me about the spiritual world. That's the way around he does it. He never says, well, divide that. Think about Moses separately to this material carnal flesh of yours. And now, you know, he never says that. He says, because I did that stuff in the material world. Now, trust me in the spiritual world. Thank you, PJ. So should I cancel our upcoming church trip to Tembe and move it to Turin? think definitely do because that's what we're saying the shroud of turin is this incredible photograph a memorial a remnant and the reason the lord gives these kind of things is so that people can go to them and see them materially so they don't just know oh there is evidence somewhere because that's all just intellectual he gives us material things because he gives us intellectual promises as well the material thing is a separate thing that you're meant to deal with, I think, materially and at least see with your eyes because it probably won't let you grab it, you know, but you can go and see it materially. And that's the best way to do it in the same way that we have photographs, not just so we know, oh, there is a photograph of it. Well, like, I'll go to the attic, I'll, you know, look through the old boxes, I'll find that photograph to remind me of these vows. And so the Lord made vows at the resurrection and we made vows when we were baptized into his resurrection there's a photograph that marks that event it's important to us it's important to him it reminds us of what happened so it is in the same way that you should go and visit these places where you stored your photographs you, they, the photograph is stored somewhere and it's open to visitors and you can see it and think more about that think about all these relics and remnants and so on that re that are material evidence of of the god who cares about the material world we live in pj blackham thank you for joining me on a photograph of god see you at the next one